Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions, San Dimas, California with a private practice in San Dimas and also in West Los Angeles. I am an Emeritus Professor of Clinical Dentistry from UCLA. Today we're going to be discussing the rubber dam placement. And our patient today, Edward, is going to be receiving a couple of inlays on teeth numbers four and five, but we're placing a number three retainer on tooth number three and I like number threes, they fit really well. And we're using a medium weight Nick Tone uh, latex rubber dam with a little bit of lubricant between the teeth and the rubber dam to facilitate the placement of the rubber dam. I'll be placing the rubber dam from tooth number three all the way over to tooth number, number 13 today. I like doing this uh, particularly when I'm working on a quadrant because it gives me great access to the area that I'm working. Some people like to only isolate a few teeth, but I found that to be very limiting. And because oftentimes I'll use a microscope, it's nice to have a wide area where you can have the scope go in different angles. And you can see that I'm using the dental floss by placing it between the tooth and the rubber dam first in order to get the leading edge of the rubber dam below the contact area. I never try to take the entire mass of interproximal rubber dam and push it through. I'm going in a situation where the dental floss is against tooth structure at all times. And that really uh, makes the placement much easier. Now, our patient Edward has very tight proximal contacts. Oftentimes, I can place the rubber dam without even using any dental floss. And there you go. You see, I think that that placement of that interproximal between five and six was a really good example. Here's another one. Look how the floss is on the distal of five and then uh, not hitting the rubber dam. Once again, we're gonna be uh, either pushing or pulling here. So we're gonna go up against the distal of number four and then without taking the floss out, just turn it over and put it through again. You notice you need uh, a lot of assistance when you have tight contacts. Uh, your chair side assistance is going to really help out the situation here. And there's the, uh, the final uh, tooth placement. I went all the way over to tooth number 13 today. Now I always like to use a napkin because the napkins are going to keep the patient from getting any chafing from the, the rubber dam. Uh, sometimes there's some leakage and you'd like to have some way of uh, you know, absorbing some of that leakage, uh, not have it uh, push up against the patient's face. These rubber dam napkins are, I think, essential to a very comfortable rubber dam placement. And today I'm using a Young's frame and I always like the metal frames. The metal frames really hold well. They have very retentive little prongs on the corners and uh, they're really, really helpful. You know, with the rubber dam gingival to the contact area already, you may be wondering why am I continuing to floss, and that is really to invert the rubber dam. I'm using the Explorer for inverting, not the beaver tail instrument, because I find that the Explorer is something we're very uh, familiar with using in the mouth. Uh, conversely, the beaver tail burnisher is rarely used in the mouth. It also can be uh, great to use in different areas. Uh, the access is amazing and you can get lingually and facially. And you notice the assistant has already rinsed off all of the lubricant and now is using Airstream to blow and follow my Explorer tip so that we can invert the rubber dam. So I think that probably one of the most beneficial steps you can take is to carefully invert the rubber dam in every area both on the facial and lingual. The floss takes care of it on the interproximal, but you'll need to use a little bit of uh, attention to detail with the assistant blowing air to accomplish an amazing seal in a well retracted rubber dam. And that starts with the dental floss by going interproximally and you follow it up with the explorer and the assistant blowing the air. We're going to do a little bit further rinsing here in the case of there may be some, sometimes there's some blood or saliva that gets on there. Maybe there's a little bit of lubricant, excess lubricant that you still need to remove. Cut off the floss now because you don't need it for any safety purposes because the clamp is already in position. And inspect everything for seal. 
it's always good to set the stage for a nice procedure by really spending the appropriate amount of time on the rubber dam placement. You notice that the rubber dam was punched with the central incisors one inch from the top of the rubber dam and that way the rubber dam doesn't uh, climb up over the nose and cover the nose and it facilitates uh, more patient comfort and they're not going to have any problems breathing through their nose. And sometimes you may even need to put a little hole in the rubber dam uh, in the middle so that the patient can breathe. But it doesn't have to be a very large hole. A little small hole is uh, plenty for patients to breathe. I hope that between the uh, preclinical videos from Rubber Dam and this video, you're getting a little bit more insights into good rubber dam. Thanks everybody. Take care.